Hi, I'm Josh from Series Andes. With my teammate Caitlin, we're going to take a unique look behind the scenes to see how such an extreme expedition was filmed, and also how it felt to be on camera round the clock. But first, here's a reminder of what our expedition to the Andes Mountains was all about. Wanted, eight young adventurers for the challenge of a lifetime. Their mission, to climb to high altitude in the Andes and help return rare spectacle bears to the wild. I'm sorry to say, we will get to the Andes. Thank you so much. I don't know whether to laugh or cry. The eight adventurers have to survive at altitude in the spectacular surroundings of the world's longest mountain range. We are so close to, like, touching the clouds. We never, ever thought I would be like this at all. Coping with the lack of oxygen is a constant battle. My oh, throat's gone all tight. I can't swallow if I know how to breathe. Living in the Andes is full of unique experiences, but not all are to everyone's taste. This is what the local people would call a treat. I can't stand anything being killed. It just really freaks me out. It does have its certain taste to it. The adventurers have a serious environmental project to build a huge enclosure at 12,000 feet, over 3,500 metres, to help prepare captive bears for life in the wild. Working in the tough mountain environment, the team are pushed to the limit. Oh, I'm just so tired and it just made me feel sick. That girl is unbelievable. She comes next to me today, I'm going to punch her. I'm seeing one very unhappy person and that's terrible. Completing the serious Andes enclosure is a phenomenal achievement. Come on! And a week later, their hard labours bear fruit, as the first two spectacle bears are taken from the enclosure and successfully returned to the wild. The eight adventurers face an unprecedented final challenge to climb Cotopaxi, one of the world's highest active volcanoes at nearly 20,000 feet, around 6,000 metres. It hurts. It really hurts. The challenge proves too much for some. Finding it hard to breathe, so I'm going down. I'm really disappointed, though. But four of the young team scale new heights, making it all the way to the summit. To achieve something so big like this, it's just too much. My perspective on life is going to be absolutely a change to what it was when I started this project. It's just been absolutely incredible. I never thought I could do it. I applied for a difficult expedition, that's where I got. It's life changing. It's all been awesome. This is Serious Andy's. For me and my Serious Andy's teammates, the expedition was the toughest thing we've ever done. I've done most of it since lunchtime. What you don't normally see is that we're also being filmed all the time. At first, some of us were a bit self-conscious about being on camera. At the start, you do notice it because you're like, I think after a while, you forget that you're there and you just relax into your normal routine and you're just yourself. I just did what I did. I didn't really act, I didn't really care. I just acted myself. I didn't play to the camera or nothing. I just was myself, really. So. Okay, no! <laughs> Early in our project, we were surprised to find a microphone on the building site. There's a hidden mic. Hello, Mr. Mike. You did a very good job in hiding it. We had been told at the start that we'd be filmed around the clock. And during a lunch break, we had a further chat about filming with Marshall, the series producer. It's just the principle that we are actually filming all the time. I mean, tell us from your point of view what happened today, Will and Josh. I was working and in the bush I saw this little plastic bag. I was like, oh, I think it's a hidden um, mic or something. And I wasn't thinking, I didn't think, oh yeah, that's going to ruin all of that that you've just recorded because you're going to have to like edit it out or something like that. Yeah, the site will be mic'd up. It's not about spying on you. Sometimes, yeah, we might have a close-up mic in an area where you're working and we're shooting from a distance, but we can still hear what you're saying. Because we didn't know that the mic was there, we felt that it was being placed there without our knowledge on purpose, deviously. Well, we might have been wrong, and I think we were wrong. 
Another thing that kept spoiling filming was that some of us found it hard not to swear. <laughs> Come on, wake up! We are we. Come on, get out! We are get out of the half naked, you Uh, likely Sarah. Sarah, please! Oh, well then, go in front of me! Oh, do you know what I'm doing? You got annoyed at, uh, me because I was swearing too much. I can't be to change the boxes. God. It's a bad um, habit and I'm trying my hardest to get out of it and I'm really, really sorry. Thanks. I know it's tough when you're used to swearing a bit, but you've just got to get into a different frame of mind where think of another word. How about ab Preferably not if it's like ab on Baba Tech. <laughs> yeah, but that's an adult programme, you know, and, it's very... And it goes out after nine o'clock. Come on, mate. No, no, no. I found filming especially hard when I was under great pressure. Stand up, Josh. I'm trying. I know. Give me a hand. I'll help you. Cameras, eh? And I found myself taking out my frustrations on the camera crew. Oh, the cameras. Go for it. Josh. Sorry, guys. I want you all to ignore the cameras. <laughs> Breathe. At one point when I got altitude sickness on Cotopaxi, uh, when I was just wanted to sit down and just sort of rest, um, they asked me how I felt and stuff. I wasn't so much annoyed, it was just I like, really wanted to just relax sort of thing, just stop for a bit. I can't be bothered! We all knew that filming the toughest moments was essential to get across what the expedition was really like. Anybody who, you know, is afraid of everything they say and do being shown on camera, it might not be for them, because it might be too much. So for me, it, I, to be honest, it didn't really bother me. <sighs> and having seen other serious series, I wasn't worried about how I would come across in the final programmes. The most important thing is we are then going to be climbing Cotopax. <gasps> You go back and to a certain degree you forget about the series until it comes out on air. And all of that time is spent looking at all the material and going, what is going to make them put the programme? What are going to be the storylines? And, and actually dealing with every single issue and every individual sensitively to make sure that there is a balanced picture of what actually happens in reality on the ground. We're trying to tell the truth. What you've got to do in return, if you want to be part of a really good series that is going to just have emotional highs and lows and move the audience and show you as the fantastic people you are, is just be truthful. And that will help me to tell that story right in the end. Come on! Come on! There is a big difference between, like, Serious Andes and Big Brother and, like, all other reality TV shows like that. Because, to be quite honest, in Big Brother, what do you do? Sit in a house full of, like, a load of people bickering. But, like, where we was, we got, like, the best experience. And I didn't really see it as a reality TV show. I just saw it as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Come on! In comparison to other reality shows, the Serious series brings out the best in people. And it, and it, really, it really highlights their strengths rather than getting their weaknesses. Hi, I'm Caitlin from Siri Sandys. I applied for a tough expedition, and that's exactly what we all got. So, I'm so out of breath already. However much you see it on TV, it's hard to explain just how hard it was living rough at altitude for three weeks. We had no home comforts like running water and flushing toilets. This is where we all do our business. Uh, it stinks. If you used to be out of at home, you can just have a comfortable bed with a pillow, um, brushing your teeth at a sink, just getting water from a tap. All these things we didn't have for three and a half weeks, so it just kind of feels so it feels mad. <laughs> I feel like a tramp. I haven't changed my clothes for about a week. I've got mud all over my face. I feel so dirty. <gasps> I found a mirror in the back of my makeup kit. Ugh. And I looked, <laughs> I looked in it. And that was a shock and a half. This is our shower. Our water comes mainly from the river. Only three people have had the shower since we've been here, and I'm one of them. Clean me. The weather up in the mountains is freezing cold, very windy, and very wet. 
the conditions like nothing I've ever experienced myself. <sighs> The weather did really bring your emotions down. Like when it was rainy, everyone was down. It affects the way how you think, the weather, and people never, unless they've experienced it, never know what it's like. I just miss them so much. I were. <laughs> In such extreme conditions, we all had huge highs and lows. Nearly all of us cried at some point. My friends, they don't really see me like cry kind of girl, so it's going to be weird for them to see it on TV. And think, oh, that's Sarah crying. Well, I didn't care that the camera's there because if you was to hold it in with the time, it's just going to affect you more, yeah? You're only as big as the dreams you dare to live. <laughs> when Matt had to read his out, he just, oh, he just broke down. But I think it was more difficult for him because there's all that stupid natural stuff that no, boys not be able to cry. <laughs> My friends take the mic out of me. They can't, they can't say that they've been to Ecuador, they've done what I've done. And if they were out there, I'm, I'm sure they would have cried as well. I just made a bad fool of myself. Ah, oh, mate, yeah. no, it's all right. I don't mind being shown crying. How are you? Hello? I'm fine. Unless people have been into those extreme conditions, then they can't say, oh, you cried because they don't know what it's like to be there and they've never felt what we felt. At times you just wanted to be alone, but there's never any privacy. This is the girls' tent. Four girls in one tent. <laughs> Boys' tent, I wouldn't go too close, it stinks. Some of the hardest bits were always being really cramped. It's really, really kind of claustrophobic. Morning. How are we doing? Tired. <laughs> Liam, how did you sleep last night, mate? Fine. Sleep all right? Mm-hmm. I didn't. I was on the lump. It was really uncomfortable. To be quite honest, you, couldn't, you, you can't get privacy out there. You're sharing a tent with, like, three other people. The only time that you really did get any privacy was when you was doing the video diary but it's not really privacy because the camera's on you all the time. This is the diary room where you tell all your feelings to the camera. I love it because it's a bit private. You stay away from the others. You was listening. Pardon? You was listening. I know you was listening. Uh. It's strange how we often seem to forget that we were being recorded at all. Blah, 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 blah. Finish. When you don't see anybody around, your brain automatically thinks, well, I'm on my own and I can talk to myself. I started eating sweets. Matt has sweets. Wait a minute. I'm not supposed to tell you that. Oops. Now for my real video diary. <laughs> it doesn't really compute that whatever happens in the diary room is going to be shown, you know, to the nation. <laughs> I have a few regrets about what I've said and done. <laughs> Well, there's nothing really I can do short of destroying the tapes. No. As well as the conditions, there were other difficult moments in the expedition. They're guinea pigs, boys. They're guinea pigs. They're alive. Our leaders, Ben and Polly, surprised us by bringing along some guinea pigs to slaughter for supper. Most of the families in Ecuador have and keep guinea pigs in their kitchen, and they eat them on special occasions. I couldn't watch being killed. That's, I can't stand anything being killed. It just really freaks me out. Although I knew guinea pigs are bred purely to eat in Ecuador, it still gave us all some tough decisions. Who here, just out of interest, is willing to have a go I don't mean to sound cool or anything, but preparing one. I will. Yeah, I'll, I'll do anything. Sorry, guys. I'm not, Sorry, I'm not, I'm not comfortable with it. Including this event in the program also involves some difficult decisions for the producers. In the serious series, this is one of the most sensitive things that we do. Um, the slaughter of animals is obviously never something to be taken lightly. 
it's always worth bearing in mind that animals are slaughtered in mass numbers daily in Britain and the vast majority of the population eat that meat without even thinking about it. Can you guys say truthfully, hand on heart, that if it came in a supermarket packet, already you done in the fillet, would you eat it? Yeah, yeah we'll it's eat a, but it's like, it, it's, you know, they're pets. It's, oh. It took me a long time as a child to realise that the animals I saw in the fields were actually the meat I bought off the supermarket shelves. And I think it's actually really important for people to realise that. While it was upsetting for some of us, we still felt it was a good thing to do. I think that it should be shown on the TV because that's what people do in Ecuador. They do eat guinea pigs and that's how they prepare them. Some people will be shot but they have to realise that's the way some people live in different countries. I think it is um, good that people do understand what happens in Ecuador and people do understand this is what they eat, this is, you know, I mean, it might come as a bit of a culture shock, you know, oh, they're eating guinea pig or, or whatever, but I think it was a good idea for Serious Andes to show that. If you don't want to see one being killed, then please, please, just move away, and then if you feel comfortable later on and you want to come back, Fantastic. I joined some others in leaving the area when the animals were slaughtered. We weren't inflicted with it. I think we did have a choice, and I think only three of us eventually did go on with it. The others went back to the tent, so we did have a choice. You want to Yeah. In terms of the filming of it, we will show very, very little uh, of the slaughter because obviously it might upset people. When we go back to Britain, we will look at all the, the rushes, we will um, debate what we can and can't show. The slaughter made us all question how we feel about eating animals. At times like this, you just get so confused because you know that when you're at home and you're having meat, it's what's happened, it's been killed like that. But just when you're Face of the situation like that is completely different. I have guinea pigs at home just like that with ginger and white. Um, yeah, it's making me feel a bit edgy, but you're never going to get a chance to eat it or skin it or prepare it. The only difference is we're killing it instead of it going back to a factory and then being skinned and then put in a packet and then going in the freezer. So my mate's got guinea pigs, you know, he gets them out and, you know, plays with them and stuff. And, and then, like, you think about, well, actually, you know, we kill cattle to eat it. But that's bread for food, and oh, I don't know. In the end, we all decided to try the meat, except for Sarah and Will. It does have its certain taste to it. I have something special about it. It's greasy. There's not much meat. That's got so ungrateful. I'm not ungrateful. I'm eating it because those are being killed to be eaten. I'm not letting them go to waste. But I'll need people sitting there telling me it's chicken before I'll actually eat it because I, I want to try it, but I don't at the same time. It made me realise that where animals are concerned, things are not always as simple as they seem. The whole series is about the fact that we absolutely love animals and think animals are so important and we're involved in conservation and so on. I don't see any contradiction between that and actually slaughtering animals to eat under the right circumstances, humanely, when animals are bred uh, for slaughter. It's actually really book. I don't regret like, doing what I did, and I'm sure like, nobody else does. I wouldn't change a bit of the trip, not even that. It's a cross between chicken and guinea pig, <laughs> but it's all right. Try and carry a rucksack that weighs more than you up here at 16,000 feet. <laughs> Whatever we had to go through in Sirius Andes, spare a thought for the film crew. Not only did they have to cope with the extreme environment, they also had to film us every step of the way. It's going to be this close, isn't it, Polly? Yeah. Yeah. They go through everything that we go through, but. In some, time, in some cases, even worse, like lugging the camera equipment up and down, up and down the mountain. We keep going back to interview people who may be in trouble. Then we're trying to get ahead, then we're going back again. 
really difficult. We're over 15,000 feet now. I can hardly catch my breath. And if you think the crew went off each night to a life of luxury, think again. No, there isn't a five-star hotel around the corner. I thought that you lot would be living in better conditions. As we made our camp over three miles oh. up the mountain, the crew stayed in one of the tents right next to us. It really is in the wilderness. There's no little place around the corner we go and have a cup of tea. It's really, it's really not that, not that easy. Up the mountain, the strong winds were particularly tough for Nigel, the main cameraman. Can I stand up? It's going to be interesting. And filming in the icy rain caused all sorts of problems. Even changing a tape was a nightmare. Each cassette contained 40 minutes of priceless shots. Too cold to operate. Yeah. Ah. The trick was keeping them dry. Get this tape into the waterproof bag. Yikes! Didn't want to do that. He's down. Thank you. And if the cameras and sound equipment got too wet... One, two, one, two. ...they just stopped working. It was the job of Ed, the technical coordinator, to try and repair the kit. The three worst conditions you can have really are a damp, dust and cold. And as luck would have it, we've got all three here. It's been a constant battle really to keep everything working as it should. And in the middle of nowhere, miles away from electricity, he had another vital job each day. No generator, no batteries, no charging, no program. Simple as that. Makes you puff, doesn't it? Sometimes we had two film crews, one getting a far-off wide shot of the scene, the other filming more close up. I'm out of breath already. Once or twice, that meant one of the film crews got in the shot of the other. So when the shows were put together, the film editors had to paint them out. Every one of us, being part of Sirius Andes was the experience of a lifetime. The expedition was an amazing roller coaster ride, full of extraordinary highs and lows. Being in the summit of um, Cotopaxi has to be the best bit, bit of the whole trip because it's just such a great feeling to be like, almost like, on top of the world, to know you've conquered something and to really achieve something. Climbing Cotopaxi was one of the hardest things I've ever done, and uh, getting to the summit it was just an amazing feeling. I can't top it. I thought of my family back home and thinking they would be proud of me of getting up this high and everything. So it was just all mm, thoughts mixed up in one and in everything. So I just couldn't handle it. So I just cried. <laughs> I was like, yeah. It's just too much. The worst bit of the trip's probably got to be where I had to get, where I got sent down from Cotopaxi. Really, really tough. Uh, just knowing that everyone else was still up there. But yeah, I had to come down. Not only did I like, not be not able to go up but I lost the chance of having the title of being the youngest European ever to climb Cotopaxi which was really gutting and um, I was really really sad on the way down because I was I'd been thinking about it ever since we knew we were climbing Cotopaxi I was thinking about getting to the top and seeing all the views and just feeling really great to be up there and when I had to come down because of altitude sickness and the cold it was really gutting. Yeah the worst thing about the trip is probably I don't know it's either the food or the music because like the food is noodles and porridge and the music is not there. Noodles every every dinner and having porridge every morning, crackers in the, in the afternoon it's just you get bored of it after a while. Now I like noodles before I came here. Now I'm just fed up with them. I can't even eat anymore. <laughs> Going to toilet behind a bush. <laughs> it's just not normal. <laughs> and there's no showers. You can't wash on nothing. It's, it's disgusting. The best bit of the whole trip for me was probably um, releasing the bears into the enclosure. It was such, and such a sense of satisfaction because you built it and to see them go into it and already after five minutes they were already enjoying themselves and walking around and exploring. Seeing the bears finally being released into wild after all their, all their suffering, all the time that they've been locked in a small enclosure was just the best thing ever.